and welcome to the CSS Podcast. Today we're diving into a very smooth new web feature called View Transitions. This exciting feature allows you to have rich visual transitions between various views of your website, whether that's between pages, within pages, or even within components. Now, this is the CSS Podcast, and this feature certainly requires CSS, but it also requires some JavaScript too, so we hope that you're ready. And for the first time ever, on the CSS podcast, we have a guest on our show. <laughs> <laughs> Drum roll, please. <laughs> <laughs> Promise Van Dam, hey, hey. <laughs> who is going to break it all down for us and teach us how to get started with view transitions. I'm so excited to have you on the show today. Very excited to be here and very excited that I get to talk about view transitions because, spoiler, this is amazing. Yes, it's an awesome feature. If you haven't played with it yet, hopefully you'll be inspired to today. Day. Um, I'm also excited because Brahmas is also a developer relations engineer on the Chrome Web UI team. So we're sort of completing the trifecta here today and getting the whole gang together. So welcome to the show. Brahmas! I'm not excited though. I'm 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 <laughs> indifferent and depressed. <laughs> Classic Adam. Classic Adam. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> welcome. Oh man, so stoked. I feel like this is a long time coming. And this topic has been so fun for me. It brings me so much uh, excitement. It brings life and positive UX feedback to the UI. And I can't say enough good things about view transitions. They are just awesome. But first things first, to set the record straight, View Transitions is not a Chrome-only feature. It's just Chrome first. So misconception, uh, because back in the day it was prototyped in Chrome, but since then it's become a fully-fledged web standard that other browser vendors can add to their browsers. And they're working on it. I'm sure Bramus is going to tell us all about it. Speaking of the browsers, right now, oh, it is in Safari. It's about to ship same document transitions, which we'll talk about in Safari 18. And Firefox has started prototyping their implementation too. So it's on the way. Yeah, it's very exciting. With, with a little bit of luck, we'll get view transitions like cross-browser maybe around the end of the year. So yeah. Exciting. Fingers crossed. <laughs> that would be a great gift. So yeah, but like let, let's let's start with the start, right? Let, let's let's explain view transitions and let's start with an example. So um, imagine that you have a photo album with a grid of thumbnails, and then you click on a thumbnail and you end up on a different page with the photo in the large view. So you have a, an overview page and a detail page, two different layouts. And right now, without view transitions, if you just click on the thing, you have this rough cut. It just swaps out from the old view to the new view, and that's it. But with view transitions, you can have a transition between those views. So for example, you could have the thumbnail that you clicked can visually grow into the large photo on the detail page, while the other thumbnails fade out, the header can slide off the screen, and so on and so on. So there's a rich transition between these two views, and that can actually enhance the user experience. Because like, if I see this as a user, if I see the thumbnail grow into the big photo, I get it. And we, we see this a lot of native mobile apps for, by the way, like where things move as you navigate the app well right now, but well, soon you can do that on the web. Yeah, so I've seen a lot of different examples, especially from YouTube lately, like on Adam's personal site, nerdy.dev, there's a great example of uh, going from a list of blog posts where when you click on one of the cards, the title gets bigger and moves into the next page. So you get some context for where you're coming from and where you're going to as you navigate that web experience. So that's cool. I've also seen some examples where you could click on, say, an avatar, and then it would get bigger and move on to the next page. So you could have some kind of like profile card that then goes into profile of you. So there's a lot of different ways that you can use this um, for those page views that are pretty cool. Yeah, agree. The continuity is super cool. Thanks for bringing it up my site. I totally should have listed that as an example here, and I didn't. It definitely has same document and cross document view transitions. Uh, another one I see in the wild, bringing up mobiles like stack navigators, where like a screen gets pushed back and a new one slides up entirely. Like this used to be really popular in iPhone one, where you swipe in this new page and see the other one fade into the background and creates this sense of a stack. And then you know where going back is to. It's going to go back to that previous one that got pushed backwards. You got animating images in a light box. So just maybe not even going to a different page. It's just opening up in a gallery view. 
Uh, we've got isotope examples where you're shuffling cards around, and instead of just instantly changing, they move to their new location, and that's really slick. Uh, I've got a morphing button example where you click a button, and it's got a loading state, and then it sends a message to you, and then it changes to another loading state, and it goes back, and all that can be handled with view transitions. You'll find links in the show notes to all this eye candy pleasure. <laughs> yeah, some of the examples that I've built are things like to-do lists where you could remove items from the list and it sort of automatically transitions or rearranging um, in a playlist your songs and you can use the buttons to sort of shift things around and use view transitions to automatically have it transition in a very smooth way without having to write all that logic. So I, I think it's cool to see this as like a full page thing, but I also have used it with the smaller components. So I like that you brought up a button too, because that little morph can be really useful where it's just happening on one part of the UI, but it could look really nice. And I recently used this on a site called anchortool.com where I'm changing the position area of anchors, which we just recorded a show on. So listen to the show about anchors. <laughs> and I'm able to use view transitions in a way that kind of makes up for something that doesn't work in CSS yet, and that's transitioning position area for anchors. So it's kind of like a catch-all feature <laughs> that lets you make things nice and smooth. And I know that we also talked about the browser support, but this is also a feature that you can progressively enhance where things might not work the exact same across browser experiences, but you'll still get the current experience, which is usually that you're just transitioning from thing A to thing B. This is like the nice way to do that in between. I'm sure we'll talk about progressive enhancement later in the show. But let's get into how these transitions work. So how do these work behind the scenes, under the hood? What happens here? <laughs> yeah. So um, well, let's, let's, let's start with a small overview first, and then later on, we'll, we'll dig into the details. But like at a glance, few transitions need three steps. So step one is that you need a trigger to indicate that, hey, there are two different views. So uh, that can be like a navigation from one page to the other, but it can also be invoked through JavaScript. But like as I said, more on that later. Then the second step is that a browser will take snapshots of the elements that appear in both views. Like remember the thumbnail in the big photo that I told you about? Well, it will take a snapshot of that thumbnail version, and it will also take a snapshot of the big photo. Now, these are not screenshots because that would be a bit too simplistic, but again, more on that later. And the third step is that once it has these snapshots, the browser will then animate them from their old position and size to their new position and size, all while doing a crossfade between the old and the new snapshot. So to reiterate, you have a trigger followed by snapshots that get taken, and then finally the snapshots get animated. Gotcha. All right. So the triggers are kind of this clutch moment right now where it's like, what kind of triggers do I have? How can I trigger or what what are my trigger options? Yeah. So here, here's the part where it might get a bit complicated because we have a distinction to make. You have um, same document view transitions and you also have cross document view transitions. And same document view transitions, those are view transitions that you run on the same document. And this is typically the case in an SPA where you mutate the existing document. But to be clear, here as well, like there's no need for a fully fledged SPA. You can also do simpler scenarios such as reordering items on a page. Um, so, so you don't need to go all in on a framework. You can just have an existing HTML page and add a little view transition on there. So that is a, a same document view transition because you're running it on that very same document. And to trigger that, you need a bit of JavaScript. You call document.startViewTransition. That's what you need to do. And the argument you pass into that function is a callback that updates the DOM. So for example, in that function, you could add a class onto an element to make it bigger. So you would have document.startViewTransition, in there you would have the function, and inside of that function, it would add a class to that specific element. And the browser will use that document.startViewTransition as the boundary to take the snapshots. It'll take snapshots right before it invokes that pass and callback, and it will take snapshots after it has invoked that callback. So that way it has snapshots of like both the old and the new uh, state of the document. Mm. So you use the document.start view transition for the single page applications, right? Yeah. What about cross document view transitions? A cross document view transitions is when you run a view transition between two different documents. And this is the case in MPAs, also known as Websites, uh, yeah, <laughs> just websites. Like you have two HTML pages, uh, they work together. It's a website. So the the trigger for that uh, cross document view transition 
is a navigation from one page on your website to another page. So that can be a link that you clicked, but for example, it could also be a form that you submitted mm. because if you submit the form to somewhere else, it's also a navigation to a new location. Mm, yeah, that's a good example. Yeah, and it's, it's that navigation there that forms the boundary line to take the snapshots. It takes snapshots of the old page before the navigation is committed. And then after the navigation was performed and the new page is ready to render for the first time, it will take snapshots of that new state. One caveat with that though is right now, this is limited to same origin navigations. We might look into opening this up in the future, but uh, no promises there. It's, it's all yeah, still being discussed. Wait, so what, uh, describe same origin navigations. <laughs> the easiest way to explain is, uh, but it's, it's not... 100% correct, but like you can have a view transition between uh, web pages on the same subdomain, roughly speaking. So you could have a view transition from yuna.com. Oh, I wish I owned yuna.com. <laughs> <start>, it's yuna.im. <laughs> <That'd be awesome. laughs> yeah, so you could have a view transition from uh, yuna.im. Uh, yep, yep. That's right, right? yuna.im. Yeah, dropping your site here. Uh, you know that I am uh, from the homepage to the about page, which is hosted uh, on the same domain. Uh, but you can't have a view transition um, from nerdy.dev to you know that I am because those are two different origins. So that won't work. So that'd be cool. Though. Yeah, right now you're limited to to your own site. Uh, you you can't do view transitions from Adam's site to Una's site or back yeah, or my site. Yeah, that makes sense. Gotcha. So the trigger in a site is just navigation of any kind. Yeah. Clicking links, submitting forms. Okay, so that's easy. And that's why there's no JavaScript required because the browser is like, hey, uh, we don't need you to tell us you're changing the page. The user clicked it and we're going to change the page. So we'll take the snapshots before and after. And on the same page, like if we're in a, is we're using JavaScript, a, a click, a form element getting input change events or just any sort of event can then trigger JavaScript, which your JavaScript then signals, hey, take a snapshot now because I'm about to mutate the DOM. And then you mutate the DOM, it waits for your callback to complete, and then now it has the two snapshots. So is that a good roundup of like MPA versus SPA in the JavaScript versus no JavaScript scenario? Sounds perfect. Rad. All right. So speaking of uh, the snapshots, so we, we, we have our trigger, we, we have our document start, we transition our navigation. Now we need to take snapshots. So the browser will do this for you. It'll take snapshots of the old state and the new state. But in order to do that, the browser will need some clues for that so that it knows what to capture. And it's you, the author, the web developer, who needs to provide those clues to the browser. Nice. And so this is where CSS comes in. Woo! Here comes drum roll CSS. <laughs> so we got this new property called view-transition-name and its value is a custom identifier, which is uh, roughly a word that just means you're going to you're gonna name it. You're going to give it your own name. So for example, like that thumbnail on that overview page that you clicked could be given a view transition name with that you set it to photo. That way the browser will snapshot it and temporarily store that snapshot with the same name of photo. And on the new view, so the page with the big photo, you also use that same view transition name property to give a big image snapshot a name. And the thing here is you also give it a view transition name of photo. That way the browser knows that these two snapshots form a pair. You've got the small version in the old state and the big one in the new state. And uh, by the way, you get one set of snapshots for free because the user agent style sheet comes with a view transition name on root set on the HTML element itself. Nice. Yeah, so you, you, you get one out of the box. Uh, sometimes you want to undo that, though. Um, in that case, you can set it to a value of none, and none says you have no view transition name, and then it won't be snapshotted. So that makes sense. I, so I know that you also mentioned with view transition name, the example that you gave was just like photo. You don't necessarily need to double dash this, but recently we've sort of been talking about it being more of a best practice to add the double dashes, which is totally valid because it's a custom identifier. It also helps you identify that this is a user created name value. So you could call that dash dash photo just as a way to differentiate things that are coming from, you know, CSS that are keyword values from things that you invented. So I like to use a double dash regardless of if you need it or not. In this case, it's not required, but I think it's like a nice best practice to kind of keep in mind when you're naming things. Yeah, same here. It makes it really easy to scan. Like you, you can, you just scan your code and then you see, oh, double dash, uh, I used that, I named that. So yeah, but with all these names in place, you have your snapshots uh, stored with that name all for free. The, the browser does it for you. Yeah, so you said snapshot a couple times, but it sounded like you were sort of describing screenshots. It, do you mean screenshot or is it 
different? Is it the same? What do you mean by that promise? Uh, yes and no. Um, the screenshot uh, as a term doesn't cut it here. Like This is because the new snapshot is not a stale copy, but it, it's a live one. It's a live snapshot. So um, if you capture a snapshot of a diff with a GIF in it, uh, in the new snapshot, that GIF will play while the transitioning is happening. It's a live view. Oh, right. That's that's awesome. Yeah. This is triggering Frankenstein in me where I'm like, it's alive. <laughs> but, yeah. So like videos will also keep playing. Yeah, right. They I, do. I'm, 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 I'm seeing like a whoa face, but I just the, the whoa face was me. Uh, I didn't hear you there. No, <laughs> we're so professional. <laughs> <laughs> so videos will keep playing too. Then not just gifts. Like if you have any kind of media that's rolling. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So uh, to be clear, that's only videos in the new snapshot. Um, you can think of it as replaced element, like um, replaced content that is shown there. Um, it won't be playing in the old snapshot because the, the old snapshot, that's a stale one. So that one is a screenshot. So the old one is a stale one and the new one is the live one. And then snapshot is like the 100% technically correct term for this. Nice, nice. So if you declare something like view transition name, say photo or dash dash photo on both images in both views, could I also give other images a view transition name of photo or is it only on specific like ids is this a class situation or an id situation it's an id situation so the names need to be unique in each view um so uh, if you want to name the other photos uh, something you would name them photo one photo two in the old view and also photo one photo two in the new view um and so on yeah if you want to transition them it is but don't fret about messing this up by the way like dev tools will show you a warning in the console it will say like hey i couldn't start the view transition because you have clashing names oh so it won't even run yeah, exactly, exactly. And DevTools will tell you why. Got it, got it. One of the things I like to do is put the URL of my destination page in front of the name. So that way that particular photo that is going to that destination has a unique name because it's using the URL. So I just kind of like prepend that word photo with the URL and kind of get myself out of coming up with all these unique names like photo one, photo two, mm. photo three. Um, so just a hot tip out there for anybody. Yeah. I imagine, too, if you're creating a lot of these, you might be dynamically creating them and setting them maybe in the DOM, like inline CSS, because that way you could dynamically update like with a unique ID as you're creating your element. That's probably how you're going to do a lot of these. I mean, that's how I do things like anchor names if I had a bunch of like tooltips on the page. So you can kind of have it in your CSS file or inline on the page, especially to just differentiate from other transitions. Yeah, it totally makes sense to to like add these as you since you're generating markup most of the time anyways, you, you can you can add these names dynamically. Another nice thing here, uh, by the way, is that these view transition names, they don't need to be added to the same type of elements. So you could add the view transition name of dash dash header to a header element in one view. And you can also use that dash dash header name on a div in the other view. And then the, the header will transition into the div. Uh, that makes me want to get weird like right now, like I want to go more, more weird things together, like a, a button that turns into an image, an image into a paragraph. I don't know, a, a, a little thing into a big thing. I, could, I don't know. This sounds really fun. Why haven't I explored more with weird view transitions? It would be cool to transition <laughs> like an SVG icon into like a more graphic photo, too, as you move. Yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah, you can you can perfectly do that. Yeah, I haven't seen that. I don't think a lot of people are doing that right now. Or yeah, what about a popover showing up from the button that you click so that they, it looks like it came from it, you know, but it it didn't. Oh, like, oh, the like, button, like yeah. the close button would maybe morph from that button. Oh, well, that's even cooler idea. Yeah. So the button you invoke it morphs into the close button and back. Ooh. The wheels are turning. <laughs> I'm going to go build that now. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, and the thing that enables this is like the, the whole snapshotting process. Like some people like often respond like, okay, but why do we have these snapshots? Like I want to actually transition the element. Well, if you were transitioning the actual elements, you couldn't morph the button into the image and the image into the div. So these snapshots are like a really powerful thing. Um, and also what these snapshots um, allow you to do is what, what's happening there is that while the view transition is running, the DOM underneath has already updated. So that way there are like no accessibility implications because mm. um, the new DOM is already there and then you get these snapshots animating to uh, their new place. So if you want to take like a peek under the hood uh, there, like, okay, but when do these snapshots get taken? Well, the browser like uh, pauses rendering for a little while. So right when you call document.startViewTransition, 
it takes a snapshot and then it pauses rendering. It updates the DOM and then it renders it, but you as a user, you don't get to see it. It takes new snapshots and then it can run the transition. So you use like one or two frames in between and then it runs. So yeah, amazing stuff. Okay, so speaking of frames in between, all that good stuff, we talked about you know how you create view transitions. We talked about setting up names and setting up unique IDs for these view transitions. So now what happens? How do you animate these transitions? What happens in that in-between? Uh, well, the, the browser does a lot of work here for you uh, because you, by default, you don't have to do anything here because you, you get the animations for free. That's my favorite yeah. way to use view transitions. <laughs> you call document start with your transition and you're done. You have a navigation and you're done. <laughs> That's all you need to do. Um, so what the browser does for the animation part is that it will construct a tree of pseudo elements onto the root, which it will then animate using CSS animations. Um, it's a bit complicated, but like bear with me here. And yeah, if you can't follow here, there's some good visualizations that Brahmas made that are linked in the description. And I would highly recommend you check out those visualizations. I'm a very visual person. That's how I learn. That's how I understand this, especially this part, because there's a lot of complexity in how these snapshots work and how they move into each other. So definitely check out the show notes. Yeah, because otherwise you 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 might get lost there. Um, but I'll I'll try to walk you through it. So we, we have a tree of pseudo elements. So let's start with the first one, which is the colon colon view transition pseudo. So that's colon colon view dash transition pseudo element. And this is a layer that gets rendered on top of the HTML element. And all the snapshots will get nested inside of that pseudos inside of that one pseudo. And so then for each snapshot pair that you have, you get a little mini tree, which is a child of that colon colon view transition pseudo element. Um, so for each snapshot pair, you have this mini tree and the mini tree consists of a, a view transition group pseudo element at the base. And then in there, you have a view transition image pair pseudo element. And then inside of the image pair, you have two other ones, which is the view transition new and the view transition old pseudo element. So these are all pseudo classes that the element, well, pseudo elements, I mean, that the uh, browser creates as you're doing the transition from one stage to another. Yeah. And uh, you don't have to do anything for this. Like the browser will do it for you. And you might be wondering like, okay, but why so many? Like, can't you just have one or two? Yeah, there's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know. But each each one of those has a meaning and a purpose. So let's start top down. So now I'm like not walking down the tree. I'm going from the top of the tree back to the root. So the view transition old uh, pseudo, that's the the one with the old snapshot, where the old snapshot gets rendered in, and then the view transition new pseudo element, that's the one where the new snapshot gets rendered. Um, and the default animation while the view transition is running is that the old snapshot fades out and then the new snapshot fades in. And these two pseudo elements, they are contained within the view transition image pair pseudo element, which is to keep the old and the new snapshot together. And it also has blend mode isolation applied to it to make sure that the blending doesn't affect any of the visual layers underneath. And then finally, the image pair is a child of the view transition group pseudo, and that one is responsible for the dimensions. It will nicely animate the position and size from the old snapshot to the position and size of the new snapshot. And if you open up DevTools too while you're doing a view transition, you can see these in action. You can see them getting created. And that really helps too if you need some kind of visual on what's happening on the page. That's a hot tip. Yeah, open up the animations panel, slow down animations, do your view transition, pause it, and you can go inspect all of these pseudo elements. It's really, really nice. I have a question that just popped up for me. So these are on root, right? These pseudo elements, are, are they above the top layer? Uh, they get rendered in the top layer. And as you know, with the top layer, uh, the last one that gets added to it gets rendered on top. So they will be on top of everything else. Oh, sick. I don't think I knew that. When you're yeah. looking at them in the in the elements panel, after you've done kind of what we just described, pausing the animations, they're all on the HTML route. They're not in the top layer little twirly. But okay, cool. So they're in the Dom penthouse. That's all I was like wondering. I was like, Dom penthouse. <laughs> yeah, they, they they get injected onto the root because that's where you started the view transition. And a little teaser for the future, maybe will allow you to have element transitions. So instead of calling document at start of view transition, you can do like sidebar at start of view transition. And then all those pseudos will get rendered into that sidebar. But right now, for now, they, they get rendered onto the root element, which is the HTML element. And that way you, you can select them in your CSS. But yeah, they get rendered on top of everything else. 
Perfect. Thanks for clearing that up because we talked about the top layer a couple episodes ago and I'm like, how does this compare? Are my dialogues on top of my pseudos? And it doesn't sound like it. <laughs> These pseudos also, and I'm so glad to have you explain them again because while I've seen your talks and I've inspected these pseudos, I still forget about them all the time. But it's clicking more and more as we go. Like the browser is generating an animation for you and multiple layers so that it can optimize these things. It can optimize the blending, the crossfading, and the position animations. Um, like things can grow, things can shrink, and they can move around the screen. All I have to do is give something a view transition name and make sure that there's a pair to deal with so that the same name is there before and after I call JavaScript or after the page navigation, and I'm good to go. Oh, yes. That's even optional. Like you you can do transitions, view transitions, with only like something being present in the old state or something only being present in the new state. And then you can use CSS to customize the animation. Uh, but I think we'll, we'll cover this a bit later on. Oh, yeah. Customization is a whole separate area. But before we get into that, to recap this and all the pseudos, you have an old and a new pseudo with the snapshots that we talked about. Mm -hmm. And then those are contained inside of an image pair pseudo. And then that's contained inside of a group. Yeah, exactly. So you have like the layering. Yeah, and you have this little mini tree for everything that you captured with the view transition names. If you capture a header and a photo and a footer, then you have this little mini tree for the header, the footer, uh, and also the photo, yeah. Okay, cool. Do you have a visualization of that too? Yeah. Okay, because I think that that would really help when you see how everything kind of stacks together, especially different parts of the page as you're doing the view transition. Just getting the, your mental state right. It's hard to listen and like understand what we're talking about, but really those visualizations help. Definitely uh, check them out if you're starting to get a little lost in the, in the pseudos. Yeah, you can find the link to those visualizations in the show notes, so be sure to check them out. Yep, those are really helpful. Just knowing that that uh, I think it's the image pair that does the blend mode, right? Yeah. I have a demo where I take a, a Flexbox visualizer and I change the blend mode to add some GUI effects. Ooh. So like I do the blur plus a bump of contrast and try to make the images as so these snapshots as they cross each other <laughs> turn into goo and then go back into regular. So yeah, these little details can end up being really important about you finding a neat little trick inside of how they work. I love blend modes. I'm happy that they're coming back. <laughs> yeah, we got plus lighter was added, especially just for that one. I don't even think we've talked about that on the show, but no, we haven't yet. So my D's for next episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we should. I mean, then we should talk about plus darker and why it hasn't been implemented yet. Uh, we can get there. All right. So, okay. You, you mentioned briefly about what if there's not a pair, right? So let's say you have a description to show into a photo, but it's only on the detail page. So if you capture that with a view transition name of description, you end up only with a view transition new mm -hmm. when going from the overview page to a detail page, okay? Because the only th it only exists on one of the two states. What do we get to do with that? Yeah, well, the cool thing is here, like these get injected as pseudo elements uh, and you can combine them with, with other selectors. So you could, to select only the new or like to detect if there's only a new, you could write a selector in your CSS, colon, colon, view dash transition dash new, then open the parentheses and, and put the name in there, but then followed by a colon only dash child so that it knows that it's the only child inside of the image pair. And you can respond to that. You can like a different animation. Oh, if there's only one in the old snapshot, then fade it in. If there's only one in the new snapshot, no, if there's only one in the old snapshot then fade it out and is there only one in the new snapshot then fade it in if there's one in both i'll just move it around on the screen uh, yeah so that, that that brings me to the next section uh, which is about customization because you can customize these as you want because few transitions are powered by css animations so you get to write some css to control how they should move and what they should do it's it's very powerful stuff um, Yay! Yeah, and and CSS podcast. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the simplest thing that you might, might want to try out in the beginning is to change the speed of the transition. And for that, you can use the animation duration property because yeah, these are CSS animations. So if you target your uh, view transition group pseudo, and you set the animation duration to two seconds, there, well, the whole thing will animate slower. It will animate over a time of two seconds. And this is why it's really important to know what those pseudos are, because the pseudos are the selectors that you're applying the styles to to create the transitions. So the selector is the one that needs the argument. If you set it to the star selector, then you target all groups. But you can also set it to a more specific name. So to target only the photo snapshot, you can use something like 
colon colon view transition group. And that's with dashes. So view dash transition dash group. And then that's a functional pseudo element where you could have photo or the name of the view transition inside of that to be more specific on what you're targeting and you're applying the styles to. Yeah, and th this is cool. Like you, you could have a default animation for all the groups and you could say like, no, no, the one photo, you get a special treatment, you get a different animation. And yeah, so the animation that you get right now, by default, the old one fades out and the new snapshot fades in. But say like, for example, you want to shrink the old snapshot and grow the new one. So that's like a scale up and scale down scenario. Well, you can change these by setting the animation name property. And one scenario where I'm using this is like when I when I slide from one page to the next page in a pagination. So if I if I go like from page one to two, I slide everything to the left. But if I go from page uh, two to one, I slide everything to the right. And for that, I use uh, the animation name property, which I then set to either slide left or either uh, slide right. Yeah. Those are the details that are important. It's really nice. Yeah, I like changing the easing too, because at, 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 like you can change the duration of all of them all at the same time, or you can change the easing of all of them at the same time. Or sometimes you don't need to fade in or fade out any of the snapshots because they haven't changed. Like I have this demo where you reorder a bunch of cards and only their position changes so that if I set display none on the old snapshot and animation name none on the new snapshot, uh, you can kind of immediately see the new snapshots. You can sort of like nullify or cancel some of this stuff for even better control. It's like knowing these mini trees is really helpful for you in selecting, targeting, and customizing what you get. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the isotope recreation that you did, right? I think you were also using um, the all the new pseudo selectors in there in combination with the only child pseudo class, right? I was, yeah, and that's because, uh, so like when I'm filtering elements, I like to think about these things as like exit stage and enter stage, and sometimes something is still on the stage but has a new position. And so these selectors let me target them. So I'm like, hey, if the new child view transition new is an only child, meaning there's no old state, it's entering the stage from the first time. And so I scale it up and give it a nice little presentation as it's entering in. Vice versa, if there's only an old and not a new, then I can know that where I'm going to, this element isn't there anymore. And I can target those and give them a scale out animation. And then I can customize with a nice springy easing. If there is a pair, if there's an old and a new, and I know that's staying on stage and it's just gonna move somewhere new and I'll give it a cool little springy effect. All really, really fun stuff to do right inside of CSS. Yeah, I suggest you all just go play with it, set some duration, set some animation. You can even set like an animation delay if you want. It's really powerful that you get to control this uh, using CSS. That said, you also have some JavaScript customizations that you can do. Uh, because when you start a view transition using document.start view transition, you get back an instance of the view transition class. So you get back an object. And this object has a bunch of promises that you can respond to. I love these promises. These have come in really, really handy just from like framework integration to just timing things. And also having that programmatic control is really nice. So like the first promise is an update callback done promise, which gets triggered when the update callback is done. So that's like when your callback function that you provided has completed. So the object that you get back will also tell you when that function has completed. So it's basically like when the new DOM is in place. A second one is ready when, uh, which gets triggered when the snapshots were taken. So you also have access to that sort of state. And the third one is when it's all finished, when the view transitions have finished. And these promises can be really, they're almost like required in some states where you're like, I don't control the rendering, like in a framework example. Like, so you start your view transition, you save the object, uh, you wait for it to finish, meaning that like, I'm gonna set some new state inside my callback, let React do some things, wait a small amount of time or even get a callback from React and then complete the promise. And I just get to time it all really nice. It's good stuff. Yeah, I use the, the finish promise a lot. Like if I wanna do some cleanup afterwards, like after the view transition did finish uh, running, then I wanna do uh, some cleanup. The ready one is also a handy one because that one will reject if the snapshots could not be taken. And this is the case when you have like clashing view transition name values. Mm. So you, you, you can like add your own logging to it as well by checking uh, that promise. And apart from these promises, there is also a method that you can call on the object, which is a skip transition. You can call this at any point in time and it will, well, the name kind of says it, it will skip the transition. Yeah. So is this like generally the overview of, so we went through, you know, how you create these snapshots, how you name them, how you animate them, customization. It's a lot of stuff to kind of keep in mind but it's a really powerful feature. And again, 
you can just use the auto styles, which yeah. I've mostly used, where you don't have to do the customization. I think it's really nice. And again, we're going to have links in the show notes with demos that do more advanced changes so you can see how to do that from an example point of view. But it's a really powerful feature where you essentially just have to either wrap your transition in JavaScript or if it's a multi-page app, don't even have to do that. You just have to give it some names. And the browser will do a lot of this for you. It'll create all those pseudo elements. It'll automatically figure out how to move them from one to the other in a nice, smooth way. And it's just a really nice feature to try out, especially when you're thinking about adding like a little extra touch, which is why I think this lends so nicely to progressive enhancement because it's something that you don't require for a user experience, but it could be a nice layer on top of a user experience. Just make it feel so much more smooth. So as we get towards the end of the show, let's just do a quick reminder about what the browser support looks like. Yeah, so right now um, Chrome is shipping both variants. Um, so we have same document view transitions, which shipped in Chrome 111, and cross document view transitions that uh, just recently shipped in Chrome uh, 126. So that was, I think it was April uh, this year that it shipped. Um, Safari is, is currently finishing their implementation in Safari 18, which will be out this September, if I'm not mistaken. And they also have expressed their support for cross-document for Rind. So personally, I'm expecting this one to like pop up in Safari Technology Preview uh, anytime soon, or it did already pop up. I'm, I'm, I'm not even following anymore, but like the, the WebKit team at Apple is, is really on board with this and they're going full troll on it. So that's very exciting. Nice. And Firefox, finally, they have started to prototype same document view transitions and are aiming to ship this in the second half of 2024. Whoa, nice. And there's also some frameworks and libraries that are shipping view transitions like Astro natively because it's such a nice feature that you can just add on to your web experience. And so I think it's really cool to see this kind of growing and growing and the positive support from the community and to see more and more examples and demos of this, especially in production. It's really cool. That there is so much more to view transitions too. Just love this breakdown so far. Um, we're going to have links in the show notes for all sorts of more stuff. We'll kind of keep it to this. I did notice we kind of skipped one thing. It's like the, one of the easiest things that you can take away from this show and just go do right now because there's no side effects is add at view transition, open up your curly brackets, navigation colon auto to your website. And if you have multi-page site where, you know, people click regular links, this will cross fade between your pages. Um, you don't have to use view transition names or anything. You just add this little snippet and in Chrome, people will get cross fades, which is a really nice sort of default. And it's a one-liner to add to your your site. Yeah, we, we have that and much, much more covered in our documentation over the over at developer.chrome.com. There's like a bunch of practical things on how to do a view transition between snapshots that have different aspect ratios, um, how to show this video playing and so on and so on. Um, we also cover some extra properties and features that you can use, such as view transition class to share animation styles, mm -hmm. view transition types to style various transitions differently mm -hmm. without the declarations of the one stepping onto the toes of the other and so much more like that. There's also a section on page swap and page reveal that we haven't mentioned. Like these are two new, oh, yeah. Yeah, these are two <laughs> new events that you can use to customize your cross document view transition object. Because like in, in the same document version, you start the view transition and you get the object in return. But where do you get it with the cross document version? Well, page swap and page reveal are the events that you need for that. Yeah, so lots of stuff definitely there to explore more features in the horizon. I know that the team is still actively working on what's next, even looking at things like possibly gesture-driven view transitions mm -hmm. and how you can access some of these things in different ways. Um, so definitely a lot to cover, maybe a lot more in a future episode too, once there's more landed. Yes, as a little teaser, like the stuff that we're, we're discussing right now is like a layered capture mode, which makes the capturing much nicer for you. Cross-origin transitions, uh, auto-naming snapshots, scope transitions, where you call element.start view transition instead of document.start view transition, and so, so much more. Some of these features will make it, some might not. It's all a bit hand-wavy at this very moment, but like, yes, we are actively discussing things behind the scenes. And the most important important thing that I want to note with that is that your feedback is very, very welcome here. So if you have a feature request for view transitions, if you think like, this is not working for me, or I want to be able to do this, but it's not possible right now, please, please let us know. Reach out to us on social media or whatever. Shoot us an email, file an issue with the CSS working group. Yeah, please let us know what you want to see next in view transitions. 
Yeah. And would you say that the CSS Working Group GitHub repo is the best place to kind of see the current status and conversations too? Or is there somewhere else? You could try and follow that, but like it's a lot. There's a lot of view transition uh, discussions uh, happening there because, yeah, we, we want to make sure that we get this one right. Uh, we, we talk with all the other browser vendors there as well. So, yeah, if, if you want to check it out, you can, but be warned. Yeah. <laughs> It's a lot of people talking and a lot of uh, replies going back and forth. It's technical. Yeah. Yep, I tried ideas. to I tried to hang in there for a bit, and I'm like, ah, oh, Bramus has this. I'll just uh, yeah. I think <laughs> the, the easiest way to follow this one is keep an eye on our blog, developer.chrome.com. Watch our Google I/O videos because, like, in 2023, we had a Google I/O video on view transitions. We had one this year in 2024, and I'm like quite sure we're going to have one next year because there's so many updates coming to yeah. view transitions. Yeah. Well, it was awesome to have you on the show, Bramis. Thank mm -hmm. you again for joining us and for all the content they create around view transitions, making this easy for people to understand and to use and for your work in making the API shape something that solves the problems that we're trying to solve. So huge props to you. And for our audience, thank you for making it this far. <laughs> As always, thanks for joining us. We have lots of stuff in the show notes for you. Yeah, if you're a bit woozy right now from all the info, uh, I totally understand. You No worries. Uh, take your time. Play a little bit with it. And one day it'll click. Yeah. It's so true. And if you've got any CSS view transition questions or even JavaScript ones, we'd love to answer them on the show. Just tweet us with the hashtag CSS podcast and we got your back. Yes, I'm at Yuna on the Twitters. That's at UNA. I'm at Argyle Inc. A-R-G-Y-L-E-I-N-K. And I'm at Bramus, at B-R-A-M-U-S. We all have good handles. Good job, us. <laughs> yeah, we got, we got shorties and goodies. I agree. <laughs> well, your question could help a lot of people. And if you like the show, please give us a review on whatever podcast app you are using or share this podcast with a friend because those reviews and those shares help people discover our show and it helps us have more time to deliver better content for you. Thanks, y'all. Looking forward to your questions. And we'll see you next time. Bye, everyone. Bye.